Hey, everybody. Welcome to Read and Reaction, the articles. Just a reminder, um, if you want to support us, please like and subscribe. Hit the little bell. That helps us out here. You can go over to readandreaction.com and read the actual article if you'd prefer to do that. Um, this is just a reading of that article because some of you have told me that, uh, you know, you're on the road or, or you just want to hear my dulcet tones here to uh, to tell you what's going on. And then if you want to support us further, you can go over to www.patreon.com slash read and reaction. we got some exciting stuff coming up, hopefully, um, at the end of the year for some of our uh, subscribers over there. And really excited about what's going on, excited about everybody who's supporting us over there. Um, we do have a tier over there where you can get a call with me and Nick Knudsen um, and, and get on a Zoom call, ask us questions about the Gators, get some answers maybe that uh, you know we wouldn't necessarily put out there on the air. So anyway, appreciate everybody helping us. Appreciate everybody supporting us. Appreciate you listening. Appreciate you reading. And hopefully you enjoy it. So this is my Vanderbilt preview. So titled, Streaking Gators Take on the Commodores. Vandy and Florida look to extend their SEC winning streak. Florida looks to extend its SEC winning streak to three games and bump its record to 7-4 and four against Vanderbilt. The Commodores are coming off its first SEC win in 27 tries over a Kentucky team that beat Florida in the Swamp earlier this year. We shouldn't be worried, should we? On its face, that's an inherently stupid question. The Commodores come into the game ranked 124th in yards per play allowed versus FBS opponents and 71st in yards per play gained, both inferior to Florida, 112th and 27th. But those numbers aren't so far apart that the Commodores couldn't stay in this one if Florida turns the ball over a bunch. I have to admit, I didn't watch anything but the last drive for Vandy against Kentucky and assumed turnovers was how they stayed in that game. But they physically beat down the Wildcats, allowing, allowing only 322 yards versus 448 themselves and actually turning the ball over twice compared to once for Kentucky. So that brings me back to the question I asked up above. Should we be worried? Quarterbacks. Interestingly, I think the answer to that question likely rests on the shoulders of Vanderbilt head coach Clark Lee. Both Florida and Vanderbilt's defenses have been bad this year, but the Gators clearly have an advantage in the offensive side of the ball. That means Lee has to figure out a way to get his offense to keep up. Lee has yet to name a quarterback for the game, but he has insisted that true freshman A.J. Swan is his quarterback if healthy. Swan is a four-star commit, 402nd nationally out of Canton, Georgia. In his senior year of high school, he completed 62.2% of his throws for an average of 7.5 yards per attempt. It's an okay profile, but not one of a star. Indeed, Vanderbilt hasn't received great play from Swan so far. His overall line, 57% completion, 6.6 yards per attempt, 128.9 QB rating, is all below average. If you use my yards above replacement, YAR, metric, designed to evaluate quarterbacks for their running and passing ability, Swan is decidedly below average with a YAR of minus 1.74. This is because he has 18 rushes for minus 55 yards, indicating he's taking a bunch of sacks. The guy who led the victory over Kentucky last week was backup quarterback Mike Wright. Wright started the season as the starter, but was benched after a poor outing against Wake Forest, where Swan played really well. Wright hasn't fared too much better through the air than Swan, 57% completion, 7 yards per attempt, 136.2 QB rating, but has added a ton of value with his legs, rushing for 454 yards on 55 carries, 8.3 yards per attempt. That helps boost his yard to 1.05, or what I would consider a really good quarterback performance. You can make an argument, and, it, and it's a fair argument, that Swan's main playing time has come against Alabama, Ole Miss, Georgia, Missouri, and South Carolina, while Wright's has come against Kentucky, Hawaii, and Elon with 30 throws combined versus Missouri and South Carolina. But the problem with that is that Swan had a negative yard in his last five starts before his injury and had three games with a quarterback rating below 90.5. This shouldn't be unexpected. In Wright's senior year of high school, he completed 64.3% of his throws for 9.1 yards per attempt, significantly better than Swan. He also ran for 716 yards on 94 carries. His recruiting profile isn't much worse than Swan's, three-star, 520th nationally, but he did commit to the previous regime, which often makes a difference. Florida has struggled with dual-threat quarterbacks in 2022 so far. Utah's Cam Rising ran for 91 yards. UC USF's Jerry Bohannon ran for 102. Tennessee's Hendon Hooker ran for 112. And LSU's Jaden Daniels ran for 44. The fact that Lee is considering anyone other than Wright just completely baffles me. On the other side, Florida's Anthony Richardson is an enigma. Through the first five games of the season, he turned the ball over seven times, and the offense averaged 23.4 points per game. Over the last four games, he's committed zero turnovers, and the offense has scored 33.5 points per game. And that change is real. SEC StatCat has a stat they track called Interceptable Percentage, INTA. 
Essentially, it's the percentage of balls that are thrown that could be intercepted. For the first five games of the season, Richardson's INTA was at 10.37%, which is astronomically high. He actually got lucky and then only 4.4% of his throws were picked, but he was putting it out there a lot. But over the past four games, Richardson's INTA has dropped to 3.3%. So not only has he not thrown any interceptions in that time, the defense has had far fewer opportunities to pick off passes than previous. Other than that, though, I'm not seeing a whole lot of development on a game-to-game basis. You can see that when looking at AR's YAR and how it ping-pongs between good and bad from week to week. Yes, the absolutely terrible Kentucky game is a distant memory, but look at the performances after that. Bad against USF, good against Tennessee, bad against Missouri, good against LSU, bad against Georgia, good against Texas A&M, and bad against South Carolina. It alternates between good and bad every week and has even alternated between halves. Last week against South Carolina, AR had a YAR of 1.70 in the first half and negative 3.27 in the second half. His QB rating in the game of 117.4 is well below average. The optimist says that this is great because a fantastic game is coming on Saturday. Of course, I kind of want Richardson to save his fantastic game for the week after because that's when Florida is probably going to need it. Regardless, whether Florida has a distinct advantage at quarterback is predicated on one of two things. First, the good Anthony Richardson from the Utah, Tennessee, LSU, or Texas A&M games can show up. Or second, Clark Lee can decide to start A.J. Swan. Defenses, sort of. As hard as it may be to believe, Vanderbilt's defense is worse than Florida, and by a significant margin. Both teams give up way too many plays in the 10-19 to and 20-29 to yard range. In the first category, Vandy beats Florida 94-109. to And they tie in the second, 35 to 35. But from there, Vanderbilt pulls away, having surrendered 25 30-plus yard plays to 15 for the Gators. That's how you end up with defenses that essentially have the same success rates against 46% for Vandy, 45% for Florida, but a Vanderbilt defense that is significantly worse by predicted points added, PPA, 0.285 to 0.219. And remember, the lower is better. The lion's share of the PPA difference comes from Vandy's futility against the pass with a PPA of 0.480 compared to 0.253 for Florida. Florida is more evenly distributed with a PPA of 0.206 on the ground as well, owing in part to the futility I detailed up above against rushing quarterbacks. But Florida's PPA on the ground just two weeks ago was 0.348, and it's 0.206 now. I detailed adjustments Florida made in coverage against Texas A&M in my recap article, but the big difference in the defense the last two weeks has really been the following. The third quarter versus A&M, 1.3 yards per rush. The fourth quarter, 0.9 yards per rush. The first quarter versus South Carolina, 1.2 yards per rush. Second quarter, 1.9. Third quarter, 4.5. Fourth quarter, negative 3.5. All told, the Gators have surrendered 55 yards on 34 carries, 1.6 yards per rush over the last six quarters. With that has come the ability for the linebackers and safeties to do their jobs rather than worry about having to to plug holes in run support. Vanderbilt isn't a team that worries you through the air, 94th in yards per play. So you would expect Florida to be able to focus on stopping the run once again. This is another reason I hope Lee plays Swan. Haynes King had 83 yards rushing on 29 carries this season, and Spencer Rattler has rushed 55 times for eight yards. Without having to worry about the threat of the quarterback run, Florida has dominated They can continue that against Swan. They'll have to adjust against Wright. Takeaway. I've done all I can here to build up Vanderbilt into a formidable opponent, but the reality is they're just really not. They're going to come in riding high after the win against Kentucky, but Florida is just the better team. That becomes clear when you look at a plot of win percentage versus PPA differentials, the offense minus the defense, for the SEC. And I threw Florida State in there in case you're interested in terms of where they are. Florida is still in the bottom tier of the SEC, but Vanderbilt is absolutely dead last. Florida played Missouri pretty close, and they're kind of close to Vanderbilt, but that was with Anthony Richardson turning the ball over twice. The Gators also struggled to beat A&M, at least in the first half, but the new Gators who showed up in the second half dispatched A&M easily. So what we have is a Gators team that's starting to play better on the side of the ball that has held it back all year. We have a Vanderbilt team that struggles on defense against both the run and the pass, though more against the pass. And we have a Florida team that has Montreal Johnson, Trevor Etienne, and Richardson to run the ball and set up some deep shots against the Commodore's defense that gives them up. Yes, the game starts at 11 a.m. Yes, the forecast calls for 40-degree weather at kickoff. Yes, Florida has historically struggled with early road starts in cold weather. But come on, folks. This is Vanderbilt. They're getting better under Lee, but they aren't in the same class as Florida right now. Johnson and Etienne run wild. 
Richardson alternates back to one of his good games, and Florida's defense gives up more than it has in the past two games, but it's able to force some punts as well. Florida, 14-point favorites, wins 38-23. to I'm 7-2 and two on my picks this year, 4-5 and five against the spread. So that's my take. That's my Vanderbilt preview. Again, I think, you know, obviously it'd be nice if Anthony Richardson could put together two big or can put together two good starts to end the season. Um, you know, instead of ping ponging back and forth, we're seeing progress. I mean, you know, we are starting to see it. I think the interception, the interceptable percentage indicates that he's improving, but there are significant steps to take. And, you know, whether he leaves the program after this year to go to the NFL um, or whether he stays, you know, these next three games, I think, are going to say something about that. If he's able to put together sort of the burrow last couple of games of the season and just start lighting people up, well, you know, the NFL is going to take notice. But certainly that'll sort of prepare Florida for what's coming next year. If he struggles, well, you know, look, I, I don't know that that's going to impact his draft stock because as of right now, he's going to get drafted on his physical tools. But I think it says something about potentially his his ability to succeed at the next level and one of the places where Florida would be able to grow because just consistency at the quarterback position beyond the explosiveness that we've seen would be it would be a welcome change. So um, look though, I, I think this is a running team. Florida is a running team, whether it's with Richardson or whether it's with Johnson or whether it's with ETN. And so how Florida runs the ball in this game is going to dictate whether they can win it. And Vanderbilt just hasn't been able to stop the run all year long. And so um, it becomes a pretty obvious pick when you look at it that way. Florida should be seven and four heading into Friday's game against Florida State. A short week, right? I mean, it's it's a Friday game coming up after Thanksgiving. So it's going to be interesting to see how everybody adjusts to that. Florida's already had one of those this year. So sort of had a dress rehearsal because of the hurricane that moved the uh, the Eastern the Eastern Washington game back a day. So they got the extended break before Eastern Washington and then the short week um, for the game after that. And so Florida's already sort of been through that, and they'll be able to do that again before they go to Tallahassee. So, again, thank you, everybody, for supporting us. Like and subscribe here on YouTube. If you like what we do, go over to readandreaction.com. Subscribe over there. It's free to subscribe to the blog. That gives us your information and allows us to, to tell you when things are coming out. And, again, if you want to support us more, you can do that over at patreon.com. We're putting up a Wednesday article over there that has content in it that you can't get on the website, can't get here on YouTube. We're also putting up post-game um, instant analysis, though this week it's going to be a little bit late because my son has basketball practice um, and I'm going to have to come back and, and catch up on the game with everybody. But uh, but sometime on Saturday, probably four or five o'clock, there will be an instant analysis video up and then have our normal Sunday breakdown on read and reaction after that. So again, thanks so much, everybody. Appreciate you supporting us and go Gators.